in a creative organization like mine, and potentially in creative organizations that you work for, this is exceptionally important because creative people, creatives, are incredibly attuned to this heart side of the equation. And so there's a lot of ways that you can let people feel like they're not only doing important work, valuable work, perhaps lucrative work, but they're also doing meaningful work. And even more than that, they need to have a sense that they're making progress in meaningful work. So that old adage, your work needs to have meaning, people find meaning on their own in different ways. But what they off, where they often get stuck or blocked is when they feel that they can't move forward. And frankly, the bigger the aspiration in terms of the meaning, the bigger the need and importance of feeling like you can fall forward in your work. And creativity in the culture and methodology helps with that problem of feeling like you're making forward progress around meaningful challenges. And I'll show you a little bit about how that might work. But to do that, I need to introduce you, take you a little deeper inside my little company. It's called IDEO. Has anybody heard of it? Uh, about half the audience. Okay. So in the, those of you who have heard of it, you can give this talk, or I could just whiz through it and make sure that everybody knows where I'm coming from. Th we have nine locations all over the world. This is the office I sit in in San Francisco. This picture is supposed to be kind of a joke, um, but it's incredibly um, dystopic, and that's actually probably what it looks like right now um, because of the, the uh, smoke that we're dealing with out in the Bay Area. But you can see we're sitting here under the Bay Bridge. This is our w warehouse that's sitting right on the water, which is right here, and this is our whole crew sort of standing out there, and there's my office right there, and the birding from that position is world class. I really love where I sit. Um, so that's what it looks like on the outside. It's a big studio, big open space. But here's what it feels like on the inside, and I'm not kidding. It feels wild. It feels very dynamic and very creative. And we spend tons of time thinking about how to keep this feeling this way. It's back to that kind of feeling of, of being supported, of being a creative person who's making progress and meaningful work with people who can connect to each other effectively. So we're about 700 people all over the world, and we're trying to change the world. That's what we're trying to do. Even, and we're also trying to make a buck. Sometimes those things are incompatible. But that's our, our goal. And the company was founded by this guy. He's a, actually an electrical engineer who started over uh, the railroad tracks in Palo Alto, California, in a program where he decided that um, he hated working for industry. And he hated working for industry because in his experience at um, National Cash Register and at Boeing, what happened is you take industrial designers and you put them in one cube, and they hand their designs over to the research department, and then it gets handed over to the engineering department, and it gets handed over to marketing, at which point it becomes completely unrecognizable. It goes to market, and none of these things are really linked up powerfully enough, and, and ideas really lose their energy as they're passed from committee to committee to committee. So what he figured out when he was sitting over at Stanford trying to get a PhD in electrical engineering was there had to be a better way to work, and it involved somehow putting people in a room so that they could get farther together. When I worked for Supercuts, I described this as feeling like often you go into a meeting and one plus one equals one and a half. What we're talking about here is one plus one equals three. Could that be so? So he got to work on that problem. And he spent 25 years working on that problem at IDEO. And after 25 years, he went back over the railroad tracks to Stanford and started the Hasso Plattner <laughs> Institute of Design, the D School. It's a joke, B school, D school. It's the D school, the design school. And the design school does not teach design. It teaches collaboration. But it teaches collaboration through the lens of design-based methodologies. So he's now over there leading this giant program, which is an intramural program. It's designed to teach collaborative skills to engineers, lawyers, business people, doctors, nurses, anybody who goes through the, the, the Stanford um, University can take classes at the D school and learn to be a better collaborator. So this is what comes out of this kind of, th this way of working. And I'll tell you a few stories about the earliest things that we worked on to bring to life the shift that's being made in this time. The thing on the left is a mouse, a proto mouse, let's call it. It's not the first mouse. The first mouse was many, many moving parts, um, very expensive, unmanufacturable, in fact. 
gears and you know, algorithms and all these things connecting to a computer. That came out of Stanford Research Institute and Xerox PARC. The challenge from a guy named Steve Jobs was make it manufacturable and make it usable by regular people. And by the way, it's got to cost less than $20 to make this thing go. So the first thing the team did, uh, some of whom are my dear friends and they're still with the company today, is they walked down the street, they went to Walmart and they started, not Walmart, Walgreens, they started feeling things. What, what should this thing feel like in a hand? Remember, there's no mouse, it doesn't exist. They settled on a soap dish, that was the beginning. Later on, I think it, you know, they had butter dishes, they had all kinds of objects, but what they're doing is they're doing a, an exploration of what this thing could feel like in the hand. At the same time, they're figuring out what could the mechanism be by which you're gonna move a cursor around on the screen. They figured out a solution, a great solution, it's a trackball, but now you got another problem. You gotta figure out how to dip that trackball in rubber where there's no bumps so it can roll. And by the way, it's gotta do some mileage. So to figure out how many miles their now rubber dipped trackball can go, they tie uh, the little mouse, this thing looked quite like, like that, onto a record player arm and they just let it rip for a couple of weeks to see how far it could go and it went pretty far. And so it's that kind of playing around in the early stages that was the, that led to a, you know, a really important innovation that ultimately got innovated more and more and more as the years rolled on. I'll skip to this one over here. How many people here are old enough to remember that thing, the silver thing? So, so that is the Palm 5. It is not the first Palm Pilot. That thing was a big plastic brick. And it was adopted very happily by early adopters who were willing to sort of figure it out and carry around this big plastic thing. But this thing wasn't gonna become much until you figured out a way to make it go mainstream. And in this instance, nothing changed in terms of what the thing could do, nothing. It's the same software, the same green screen, the same calendar, the same contact database. That's the same stuff. What's changed now is what it looks like. It's thinner, and it's slim. It's using a technology that was stamped anodized aluminum that was only being used in cameras at the time. This is in the mid 90s. So you gotta figure out your manufacturing strategy. It's got, you can hang stuff off it. There's a rail on the side. You can hang a stylus, you can hang a cover, you can hang all kinds of things, your keys potentially. It's inductively charged. It, you, there's no wire anymore. You don't have to plug it in, you just set it in its little cradle. It's sexy as hell, I think. And so what that meant is that it started to become a lot more relevant, particularly to women. And this is what it took, was to create this kind of emotional link to an executive's accessory, if you will. That's what puts a computer in people's pockets. It's not just the functionality, it's the connection they have to what it says about them and their identity. So there's some seminal technology things. I'm gonna tell you two more short stories about what this approach was uh, unlocking. The thing on the left is a world-changing invention that is a dial-a-dose insulin pen. Now, it's hard enough to create a pen that has unbelievably tight tolerances that can be manufactured in the millions for a low cost and put into the hands of people who need insulin. This idea is that you can turn the dose and dial what you need, dial it up, dial it down, is a big idea. But here's the bigger idea. I can now inject myself with insulin when I need it, where I need it. Um, that might mean I'm sitting in a restaurant and I inject myself in the leg unobtrusively under the table with nobody knowing. And that means I take my insulin as opposed to walking into the restroom laying out my works. That's a pain, that's embarrassing. I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna adhere to my drug regimen. So this technology is super powerful because it gives people power back to do the things they need to do to take control, not just because it's a genius invention. This thing on the other side is a portable defibrillator that basically takes a crash cart and makes it into that small package. But more importantly, it's the instructions on what to do in a crisis that real people can follow when they're freaking out. So these are the things that design unlocks. And this is where more problems today need to sort of take this approach. Today, it's being applied to voting. This is how they're gonna vote in Los Angeles in 2020. Eight million uh, voters in the city of Los Angeles, in the county. And every single one of them needs to be able to use this 
no matter what language you speak, how tall you are, what your disability is, you need to be able to do this. So this is complicated systemic problems. This is a school in Peru that is designing, designed to overcome the problem that there are not enough good teachers in Peru to teach the population of Peru, which is emerging uh, from poverty for the first time in ever. Uh, and we need a faster way to think about getting kids a great education. Design can solve these problems. That's a radical thought. Um, so let's get into why, how this is working. And I'll give you first the atomic, the atomic unit of creativity, which is T-shaped people, T-shaped people, full stop. That's the atomic unit. But you roll that up into multidisciplinary teams. What's a T-shaped person? A T-shaped person is somebody who has great skill at what they do. Um, so they might be a great engineer. They might be a great designer. They've got something that they know how to do. It's world, world class. And in many cases, now we've got pie-shaped people because they've got, they're a really good engineer, and they're also an architect. Or they're a really good landscape designer. They're also a graphic designer. So you've got these skills. Or they might be a great business person. But this is the key. You've got to find ways to measure, or to um, cultivate, and look for the ability for folks to connect to other people. In our culture, and I would argue in many design-based cultures, the things you're looking for are empathy, optimism, and curiosity. That is what connects people across the next atomic unit, which is the multidisciplinary team. So we rigorously search out these people. We could build a whole company just with the best engineers and designers in the world, and we'd have nothing. We have to find the folks who can connect to each other. So how do you do that in creative design culture? You do it through understanding values and managing to values, and not values in a kind of put it on the website or throw it in a big book of the company and chuck it under a desk. We work actively, did that one, oh, those are all the people that we're trying to get in the room together, and let me, here we go, these are values, these are ours, be optimistic, collaborate, take ownership, there's only two or three more, um, come on, talk less, do more, embrace ambiguity, the hardest one, the hardest one to interview for, the hardest one to hold, the hardest one to cultivate. This is, you know, when we screw up and we have somebody who's freaking out in this super creative culture, it's probably because they're struggling with this particular one. We have developed a high art of how to not only interview for these skills, how to cultivate them in our more junior folks, but how to engage with these throughout the entire arc of a career. So when there's a problem on a team, or somebody's performing extremely well, you can probably find the answer to why by going back to this. This is an operating document, as I said. It's not just a, something we had to do. The other thing that we connect around, that we connect creative people around, is a belief system. In our case, we all believe that everybody is creative and has something to contribute, not just in a motherhood and apple pie way, but everybody needs to contribute. Everybody needs to build culture, Everybody needs to contribute creatively to any endeavor, be that making the place a great place to work, or be it great marketing campaigns, or be it great deliverables for clients. We also believe that that is a competitive advantage, that creative organizations are more agile. They're more nimble, they're more responsive. They have more points of connection across the network of the organization. So they're gonna be in a conversation about how to respond to threats, or new developments, disruption, whatever it may be. And this is the business we're in now, which is helping organizations bring that agility and create in the form of creativity into their organizations in order to be more future fit. So you may have heard this term design thinking. I don't want to make too much of it. It's what the world has come to call a way of working that I'm going to just highlight some of the, uh, the uh, methodology now for you. Um, but basically, the big idea is that in a world where we all have to be thinking about the viability of businesses and we all have the possibilities of new technologies that we can embrace, that people have to stay in that equation. And in fact, if you're doing it right, you will always come back to people throughout an, the arc of an entire engagement or project, always coming back to the needs of people. I'll say more of that lo later on, but you can measure the number of times that teams are going out to what we call pulse their customers or pulse their stakeholders. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. 
So let me just give you a taste of some of some of the things that you might think about doing if you're not doing them already in your world. Here's one. Design thinkers listen and watch. They pulse their customers, but they do it differently. They know the difference between what is market-based research, which is how many can I sell, to whom. This is a very kind of more analytic approach to sizing markets and market potential. Design research takes, is looking for inspiration. What's possible? What could we do? What could we make better? And the difference is, in the old days when I was you know, doing research back, you know, with Ben back at, at Supercuts back in the day, we spent a lot of time and money sitting in dark conference rooms doing focus groups, eating a lot of M&Ms. But we were listening to what people were saying. That's a cognitive response. And we were watching what they were doing. How often are you showing up? You know, how long are you waiting? We were measuring all these things back in the day. And that's a sort of one side of the equation, and that's very valuable. But what we were missing, and the thing that was revealed to me with Griffin, was, um, are you signaling me? Oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> um, the thing we were missing with Griffin was this thing over here. What was he feeling? What was he sensing? What was he thinking? And by the way, whatever he's thinking, he probably isn't going to express it. We have to intuit our way to some of those things. Make some educated guesses. So focusing on all four of these quadrants is important in terms of how you're getting that inspirational kind of research about what's possible in serving people. Listen, oh, I said that. Here's the next thing. If you're trying to size a market, you're going to look for the place, the middle of the bell-shaped curve. Like, where are the people? I want to sell a lot of stuff to them. If you're trying to do something new, you're taking inspiration from the edges. So if Birkenstock comes to you and says, what could we do with our shoe line? You don't go for the person who loves Birkenstock and buys a lot of them. You go for the guy who has a shoe fetish or the you know, people who are doing extraordinary things with feet and shoes, and you're looking for inspiration. And so we have actually people in the organization who design those inspirational journeys for the multidisciplinary teams to go on, to widen out. One of our clients' favorite things to do is to go out into the world and find inspiration. Great place to do that, we go to Japan a lot. Um, but there's lots of ways to basically keep yourself inspired. In fact, we as leaders say often, it's our jobs to stay inspired and to transmit that inspiration to others. And a lot of these kind of edge kind of contexts are the places we go look for that inspiration. So try that in your work. Here's another one. We learn from ex uh, analogous experiences. So uh, if you're looking to refine the um, tool set or the methodology for a high-performing surgical team, you can go look inside of hospitals and you'll see the state of the art. Or you could go out here into the world and go look at a NASCAR pit crew. They're in high stakes operations. They're moving really fast. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of danger. You need to work tightly in a coordinated way. What could we learn from that? And then the other thing about design thinkers is they know where they are in this process. We call it diverging and converging. Every development, creative development cycle is iterative. You're going to go through these cycles. I'm sure you've all experienced that. However, it's really important to know whether you're in this moment where you're trying to create more choices or whether you're trying to narrow down to a few choices. And this, by the way, is where brainstorming gets into trouble. Brainstorming typically brings a group of people together to get more ideas on the table and from the beginning starts converging around why that won't work and that's the better idea. So you're mixing your streams in a bad brainstorm. So the idea, if, you know, these are our rules for brainstorming. When we do it, it's, you know, it's not like you know, science or anything, but we, we try to get 100 ideas on the table within one hour. Just go, go wild. When I was at Supercuts, they actually proposed hanging my customers upside down by gravity boots and then just like trimming off the bottom. Now, that's not a serious idea, but it could actually lead to the next idea, which could be a serious idea. So these are the rules, defer judgment, encourage wild ideas, build on the ideas of others, but stay in that open space. Anything goes in that space. And if you need to do it again, you can, but resist the temptation to be devil's advocate and say, let me tell you why that's not gonna work. Also, often the boss has to leave the room because people actually are waiting for the boss to opine on all those different ideas. That's why you get to get the boss out of the room is the boss is typically pushing toward a solution rather than new options. Okay, that's enough on taking inspiration or having empathy for customers and stakeholders. 
I think you, you are all, if you're in the field of landscape architecture and design, you already know how to use prototypes better than anyone. You build beautiful examples of what your work could, how the, your work could go out in the world. So I'm gonna focus on prototyping today at the crummy end, the really dirty, messy, cheap end of it, and just say, how can you bring prototyping earlier into your development cycle to learn and fail sooner? And so here's an example of that. Back to that big plastic brick called the Palm Pilot. This was how you start noodling with interfaces. Pick up a pen, start drawing on the object. So that's a very simple example. Here's a more complicated example that would have made a big difference in my career uh, with Ben at Supercuts if we'd been able to do this back in the day. These are owner operators of Marriott town play suites. You know, they're extended stay hotel, uh, hotels. And w in order for Marriott to convince these owner operators to go to the next generation of design of their spaces, they're going to have to invest hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more, in order to remodel and refurbish these spaces. And a lot of the problems with that remodel won't be visible until a lot of investment has been made. In this particular case, we're building foam mock-ups and studios in downtown San Francisco. They're really fast, they're really rough, they're really cheap. And these are the owner operators walking around literally kicking the tires, or in this case, kicking the desks, saying, that's not gonna work. My CPU's not gonna fit under that desk. Or some kid's gonna punch himself in the you know, eyeball whizzing around that corner there. So you're de-risking early with cheap materials. But something more important is happening here, which is they are start the owner operators themselves are starting to take ownership of this. They feel included in the process. This is the power that has unlocked design thinking in sectors, in social sectors, because the, when you have diverse stakeholders, you need to bring them on a journey. So you need to get creative about how you think about immersing them in that process. They don't necessarily get to choose, but they have to feel involved. And so we're finding new ways to do this for social spaces, for public spaces, for um, all kinds of spaces that we didn't think we could go. This is, let's see if this will work. This is a very quick and easy way to do a rough and dirty prototype for, you know, what I think you probably recognize as the iWatch. Um, anybody can do this. You don't need to be a designer. That's actually much prettier than it needs to be. And by the way, what you're doing here is you're starting a conversation that is generative. It's not about the prototype. It's about the information that unlocks. Earlier, there was a slide that said, never go to a meeting without a prototype it should be amended. Never go to the meeting without two prototypes. Because if I say, Al, what do you think of this? You're like, I hate it. Then we're done. But if I come in with two and I say, which one do you think works better? Tell me why. Now we're in a conversation. And by the way, it's not about you hate my design, meaning you hate me. It's really, we're going to find our way and we're going to learn something. One plus one equals three by having this dialogue. So what we're doing is we're building prototypes to start conversations, not necessarily to reveal ideas and where we specifically want to go. This is business class for um, British Airways. This is prototyping service. How is the food going to be delivered in business class for Lufthansa? So there's lots of different forms, role play, animations. They're, they can range from you know really cheap and easy to this is obviously much more complex. This is the number one most performed operation uh, in the United States now. Uh, it's used by Nose, ear, nose, and throat surgeons to perform sinus surgery, and um, that's a surgical tool, or it's the beginning. This was actually created by a doctor who said, I need a pistol grip type thing. I need this hand free to do something else. I need to feel this kind of balance and weight in my hand, and that led him to feel very included, very considered, and went on this exploration that ended up being not too far from that. And this is the last prototype I think I'll show you. This is for Sesame Street. We're trying to develop um, gaming apps for kids. And in the earliest, the idea there is you get them as rough and crude as you can and sell them as early as possible in the cycle uh, and get a licensing kind of agreement. So these are our designers role playing what that app could deliver and they're doing it with a piece of foam core. So the creativity behind just thinking about how to build prototypes, to have conversations, to, to, to build momentum for ideas is where the power is in this way of working. Okay, so next last question. Why creativity? Why now? Why is, we're in the business now of 
designing a lot of stuff, but more importantly, we're trying to help organizations onboard more of this way of working. Why? Because. There's, here's the rational answer in the heart money balance. Design-centric companies are simply more valuable. Fact. They outperform. Uh, and there's a whole basket. This is an old basket of companies. Not all of them are top, top, top anymore. But there's many studies now that show that when you put these practices at the center of culture, that good things happen in terms of the valuation of the company. But here's another reason. Uh, you can cultivate this. We've gone on a bit of a journey from when I started 20 years ago at IDEO, where design and design thinking was a lot of arm waving. Today, it's being practiced, it's being measured, it's being managed. And this is how we think about those activities that you need to measure and manage for. First of all, leaders who clarify intent, that's the start. That gets you a 20% gain in terms of your leverage and getting good ideas to market and seeing the market return. That one I mentioned earlier, teams that frequently pulse their customers more than once a month. You can measure how many times you went out into the world or you connected in some way to a stakeholder. That is something that is knowable and manageable. You, what's the next one? Shazam. Teams that explore and iterate on five or more solutions. So remember that idea, not one prototype and one idea, two, or even better, five. Always having a pipeline of new things, wanting to drive forward, diverging around new options, converging around what the better one is, and then diverging again around how to make that better. These are all compounding your advantages. Teams working in parallel across functions and work together daily, that's a bit gnarly. Um, teams with decision-making authority and a clear way forward. This is this idea about pushing the arbiters of what is good down into the organization, which is incredibly important in, an or in, a, in a world that is becoming so disrupted. You've got to get the information and decision-making down lower in the organization as opposed to this waterfall of from the top. That makes organizations sclerotic and they can't move. And last but not least, space matters. You know this. Teams who create space to problem solve in this, during implementation. So team huddle spaces, having the work products surrounding you, getting out of those big desks, uh, excuse me, the big off-corner offices and into team-based spaces. You can measure and manage those things as well, and you can see the impact that they have on creative organizations. And the overall impact is profound. So don't take my word for it. This very um, uh, well-known organization called IBM did a study that just like rocked my world back in 2010. They recently did it again uh, just this year and came up with a similar conclusion. Hey, but here we are in 2010, we've just had this precipitous economic collapse um, and the world is really trying to figure out how to get back on its feet economically. And they do a study of 2,200 CEOs all around the globe from both public and private institutions around the globe. And they say, what matters in the CEO? What's the most important uh, thing uh, for CEOs to get right today? And the answer was, for the first time, not operations, finance, mergers and acquisitions. So the answer for the first time as of this point in time was that creativity is the most important thing. Because we're living in a world of constant disruption, which you've heard a lot about. And so pushing creativity down through every level of the organization, learning to lead like creative leaders, learning to start to measure and reward these behaviors that allow organizations to be more agile and more responsive in this kind of world is really what matters most today. So it's a different way of thinking about creativity. Oh, there's one of my transitions. So I want to leave you with two questions to take home with you Monday morning. If you want to try, put it to work. Where might you try to gain a new insight through empathy. And the second one is, we'll never know. Where can a prototype help you learn faster and bring people along and build momentum for ideas? So I don't know what that has to do with plants, but we'll figure that out the rest of the day. And that's all I got for you today, <laughs> OK? That's all I got. Thanks for your time. We have some time for questions if anybody has one. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. The well, I think. Uh, 
larger sort of that, you know, uh, part of having a building is not a small deal. So I'm sure that you're involved in that. Um, physic, like in terms of how much space it took up? Right. Well, well, I tell you, we, I, I can't speak to the sort of like the acreage of any one prototype, but I can tell you we go into context all the time, public spaces. For example, many years ago we were involved in helping Berkeley think through Sproul Plaza. That is a, that is a third rail. Like, you know, there are many BW buses turned upside down in that space. Um, it's, you've got a lot of stakeholders, you've got a lot of passion and ideas about what can happen in that space. And what we started to do was start to build and literally go into the space and build things out of foam core and stand things up and do a lot of role playing. So we were in this enormous space, but what we were doing is starting to drive tangibility into the touch points that would inform that space. So they can be quite, um, quite large, but they'll sort of drive down to like what is in that space. We do a lot of work with banks, for example, who have enormous real estate problems in that they've got big, empty, cavernous spaces. And so what we've gotten quite good at doing, actually, is starting to iterate in public, out loud, in front of customers and everyone, and being very transparent about what we're doing in that space. You're getting feedback on the fly, you're living in beta, and what has happened in those spaces is that's where you get transference. The bank clientele themselves start to figure out, I can do that, and they start doing it. And so you start seeing them grab foam core and tape and start mocking things up. And that starts to become a language or a currency or a way of connecting folks. So that's the most powerful, I think, idea about how, why to do prototyping is it's really easy to teach people to do that and then they can use that for themselves. Hospitals um, are starting to teach nurses how to do this so that they can communicate faster. One of the examples that came out that I love a lot is um, nurses were recognizing in this one Texas um, system of hospitals that the transitions when they do shift changes were costing the hospital a lot of money, leading to bad data transfer, and really pissing off people who are in hospital beds. So the nurses themselves started to grab whiteboards and they themselves decided to do debriefs at the client's bedside with these whiteboards where they were checking things off. And then that turned into something made out of foam core where they would literally start taking away pieces of the protocol, say for a woman who's gonna go home with her newborn baby. You take things away until there's no more blocks on the uh, whiteboard and when they're all gone, she gets to go home. So that equipping those nurses with the possibility to solve their own problems becomes the platform for starting to think about whether there's a bigger systemic solution that folks should be investing in, like the hospital staff, for example. And in fact, in that instance, they did. They started to invest in these kind of um, knowledge boards that were in the room with the patient and started to do knowledge transfer by the bedside. So you can see how these things cycle up just based on behaving in this new way. I got way off track in your question, but they can be as big as you want them. Any other questions? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Why is that on your mind, Ben? Um, I'll, I'll tell you, my favorite example of how it's relevant, say, to the sales cycle is actually it's this idea of putting people on the same side of the equation. So one example I can tell you about is... Um, uh, there was a real brokenness in Safeway's relationship with Kraft with regard to a product called Capri Sun, which is Safeway stopped buying it because it was piling up because they couldn't pick the flavors that were going to be pulled through. Capri kept sending them all the flavors. And so what they were doing was they were picking open the packs in the back office, in the back uh, warehouse, and there was spilled product everywhere. There was, they were out of stocks on the shelf. What they did is they basically set up this kind of uh, 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 listening tour with members of the craft team and members of the Safeway team to go on a journey of discovery together, side by side. What do we see? And I can't remember exactly what the aha moment was, but by putting them on the same side of the equation and putting them part on the team together and giving them the tools of starting to imagine new solutions, they found some things that they could work on together. And there was a lot of joint ownership in those solutions as opposed to the toing and froing of shoving solutions back and forth across the desk at each other. So just that idea of setting up the multidisciplinary 
team, in this case it's multi-organizational team, and having them go on that journey of discovery and looking and creating new options and converging on the best option went really far in that particular relationship. Again, it's the verb, it's not the noun of the, you know, the process being the noun in that case. So fundraising, different question. We can talk about that later. <laughs> That's a hard one. <laughs> Anybody else? Nope. Good for time? It's my pleasure. Thank you for your time. So let me just get my bearings on our uh, presentation. Oh, there we go. Um, so my name's Nancy Seaton. I work with Future Green Studio. I'm an associate designer, and I'm the plant person in the office. Um, so I get to work with all of the designers and work with uh, developing concepts with them. Um, I'm really excited to be here today um, to talk about plants. It's one of my favorite things. Uh, <laughs> but I kind of geeked out, and I put way too many slides in. So. Apologies if I start talking extremely fast at the end of this lecture. We will not start. We will not start. Oh, cool. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Whitney. <laughs> um, plants are the essential material in landscape architecture where the power of the discipline is found. We're not architects. We are investigating or planning growth over time. To harness the potential of plants in our designs involves a duration of study. There are no shortcuts. This breadth of knowledge intimidates people. There is even separate language to learn. There's a botanical Latin. And so many people don't want to learn plants because they fear this breadth of knowledge or the time that it takes to, to even have a little bit of that knowledge. But it should excite you. Uh, there's always something more to know, deeper levels of knowledge, or frames of context to use that augment our design concepts. Our observations toggle between micro and macro, from spores on uh, moss to the, the large scale of patch dynamics and even lead to the metaphysical, especially if you're alone in the field enough like I am. J.B. Jackson uh, uh, wrote in his seminal book, Necessity for Ruins, that exposure to wilderness, or in our case, urban wilderness, subdues the omnipresent clamor of the ego and reveals that we're inseparable parts of the cosmic order. Not only can observation of natural cycles put the demands of our own lives in perspective, creating places where other people can have the same sense of connectedness, um, it, uh, creating places where people can have the same sense of connectedness is paramount to what we do. Um, but that's not to say uh, that I, I don't appreciate fine gardens and subtle and not so subtle mix of plants. I, I love urban wilderness, but I also love gardens. Um, but I do prefer this loose space, like the wilderness we find in our streets, um, is this sort of wildness in the city that offers uh, an ambiguity, as Whitney was talking about, where there's a natural and a cultural hybrid that I find um, the most inspiring. So this is my background. I worked at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden for 15 years, starting in 1994 and going to 2008. Um, I designed uh, seasonal borders, like this tulip border, uh, cool season borders with pansies and um, bellis, poppies, uh, and then a warm season border where we tried to amplify the height of plants in one season. Most of these plants were grown in, uh, from seed, and it was always remarkable to me as the gardener who orchestrated this that they could grow about six to eight feet tall. One year we had bananas and they grew 15 feet tall. Um, so kind of remarkable. We tried to do themes. This was phytogeographic year. This is, uh, you're in Africa currently. Uh, Mexico on the left and just some cool annuals we started from seed uh, with propagator Alessandro. I was also responsible for uh, augmenting the existing perennial garden, uh, finding new plants, new things in cultivation, and things that I could grow from seed. Again, with my, uh, my friend Alessandro, who's a propagator, uh, seeds that we'd get from other botanical institutions um, through seed index. I had pretty traditional gardens. I was always um, trying to play with the idea of this loose design space, or plants that have a more sort of like loose habit, um, the tension between that and when plants actually fall apart, when things don't hold together. With design too, you wanna have a loose planting, but you don't wanna have a salad. 
At the same time, as I was doing this sort of like strictly ornamental horticulture and seasonal tulip displays, I was going out with the scientists at the Br Brooklyn Botanic Garden who were operating a, a really interesting program at the time. It was called the New York Metropolitan Flora Project. And I'm not sure if any of you in the audience have heard of that project, but it was with the, um, the uh, vice president of science at the time, Steve Clements. And it was curious um, to have that particular program because most of the botany in New York City focused on economic botany and tropical botany. Um, so it was nice to have something that was so urban focused and so early on thinking about like the neighborhoods. This is in 1990 uh, was when that program first started. Really long time ago. So we're still talking about some of the same concepts today, um, many, many years later. And I feel so old when I think of uh, 1990, <laughs> like uh, going out with these scientists. Um, the most interesting thing about uh, going out with scientists and documenting uh, the flora of New York City was, um, was finding that there's like a cosmopolitan flora that pretty much hangs together no matter where you are in the world. It's a group of core plants that are kind of like the garbage plants or like the pigeons of the botanical world. No one really loves them. Um, I, admit, I love them, but I also like pigeons. Um, so what do I know? Um, These plants all grow in the wake of human intervention. They, um, they're the things that we see all the time on our city streets. You see the plantains and the carex. Um, along with going to document the plants in the New York metropolitan flora area with scientists, I also went out with an amateur botany group called the Tory Botanical Society that went out at that time almost every single week to different places throughout the city. And we were going to pristine uh, areas. We weren't judging the plants that we found. It was really just a documentation of what was existing uh, in terms of the, the science program at BBG. It was comparing what was currently being found to what had historically been in the botanical record. And they did uh, a whole documentation through herbaria in the region to understand what had been here before. And I think that resulted in maps where they were actually starting to analyze the comparison between the two. Um, but as a recent transplant to New York City in 1994, a million years ago, uh, it was really exciting to learn the city as I went out on these trips and to like, have a different perspective of the entire city because we went to places that you wouldn't really think of going to otherwise, like Secaucus. I'm, you know, like I apologize if anyone's from Secaucus, but uh, it wasn't sort of like you know, going to the Adirondacks on the weekend. It was like going to like a strip mall or going to see like a, a marsh or Phragmites or going to check out Newtown Creek or the Gowanus. And I have nothing but respect for Elanthus, but I mean, you know, and I hope you have an appreciation for it too. I had never seen it sort of open up um, before and in the past few years I've seen it unfurl. It's all over Red Hook where our office is. And I always just have a, a respect for any plant that can tolerate the conditions that, um, that these plants tolerate in the, in the, um, in the city. They take, they take foothold wherever they can find a little gap in the street. Um, when you're on these sites, you never know what you're going to find. Uh, you find unexpected things like this, um, obviously a time machine in the Gowanus. And you find nature in unexpected places, as well as finding unexpected things in nature. Uh, there's an interesting uh, study by this um, scientist from Germany, Ingo Kowarik, who's the author of Wild Urban Woodlands. Um, he worked at one of the technical universities in Germany. And he writes in the same way, following the, the work of the botanic garden uh, scientists, uh, that urban ecological research began really in, in force in the 1970s. Scientists identified natural colonization processes occurring on large abandoned industrial sites throughout cities, uh, which was the hybrid result of cultural and nat natural forces. The process, he states, starts with cracks in sidewalks or in the colonization of walls and buildings, sort of artificial cliffs, and leads to growth in abandoned areas into impressive urban industrial woodlands. Basically, a similar succession pattern to former agricultural land out in the countryside, which I'm more sort of like in, in, in tune to, where you see fields transition into second growth forests. 
we can witness dynamic natural process in rail yards, abandoned lots and tree pits, and along seams and sidewalks. Cycles of disturbance, including the human activities of pulling weeds and mowing, create opportunities for new plants to germinate and spread. And as I said, plants do not discriminate between locations. They don't have volition. They're not bad plants. They're just opportunistic, and they take hold where these opportunities arise. So here's Red Hook. It's my neighborhood. And you can see that the, the seams of these, um, of these plants and like the, the, the breaks between the concrete are already coming together to form sort of an urban meadow. Here's more at Fort Tilden. Uh, we've been to naval forces, naval, naval bases where they also um, start inhabiting the cracks. And they aggregate into these beautiful fields that sort of uh, are very similar to more pristine conditions or to planted conditions like this uh, little blue stem meadow out on Long Island that's uh, behind a client's house. Nature and natural process does not just happen in other places, it happens within the city, which is always just the most in inspiring act of all. Here you see moss coming up between an expansion joint. Here's another little pocket in a New Jersey barrier where plants are taking foothold. Um, and we document this process in our, our neighborhood. We have a, a project in our office called SEP, uh, which is Spontaneous Urban Plants. And we go around and document it and, and engage everyone in our office to participate in this project, whether you have knowledge or not about plants. And these are two of my friends. We were so excited to find Trega Pogon, which is like one of the coolest, uh, um, very pretty rare in our neighborhood. So we were uh, exploring that and taking Instagram photos of it. Uh, we're also always excited to find uh, Potentilla recta, uh, other rarities, other like special plants amongst the weeds. And then we document that for things like the Gowanus Bioblitz. Here um, we helped Diana Gruberg of the Gowanus Canal Conservancy out with her uh, Bioblitz this past spring. And we document it for different, uh, for different other reasons. This is a little project I did for a, a class at the GSD where I just documented the Boston Harbor Islands in sort of a classic old school herbaria uh, way. This is just for myself. Um, and just going to sites throughout uh, field studies, exploration of, of places. And I, as I was going through all my photographs um, and getting excited about weeds, um, I looked at these photos and they were places that I have that, that, that no longer exists. There's sort of like document, documents of, uh, of weeds long since gone. This is Hunter's Point, um, post Sandy, where it just revealed a huge earthwork. Exploring the urban wilderness can foster a sense of discovery and a, chain, a chance to engage with dynamic biological process on a daily basis, as opposed to going out to some urban or some uh, giant um, American national park in the West where most people think of uh, wilderness as existing, like in the West. The industrial infrastructure with which we have constructed our contemporary world, absent in pristine wilderness, actually characterizes the newly defined urban wilderness. And we have juxtapositions like this with natural systems. I remember the first time I went out to Fort Tilden and found this spaceship that had landed behind a, an, a sort of like a naturally occurring dune. I don't know if any of you have been out there, but it's a remarkable juxtaposition between sort of like our touch and the human uh, and the and natural realm. And of course, the High Line. Um, these new wildernesses are areas allowed to evolve without horticultural planning or design, but instead respond to human interventions and management techniques, which are sometimes beneficial. These are some new sites I've been going out to with the Connecticut Botanical Society, um, and there are these highway cuts or the power line cuts. And we find things like chicory and bladder campion, but we've also been finding things like wood lily, which is a pretty rare plant in Connecticut. And there was a, a huge population of them. There's about 20 plants all together in one place. And also just, you know, like stalwart, cool native plants like Asclepius doing their duty to provide po pollen to our uh, fauna. This is a cool plant, um, the stiff aster, that's all over a park just outside of New Haven, Ionactis, just it, strictly on the roadbed, along with a host of other rare plants. Uh, we visit sort of pockets of rare plants throughout the city. This is an inwood where uh, there's a uh, existing po population of Dicentra pupillaria. 
And then finding cool things just on the street as we're exploring the city, like this kudzu that was on several uh, different Brooklyn gas um, facilities in, in the city. Spontaneous urban plants enhance the poetic qualities of places like cemeteries and, and the rest of our cities. It's sort of more of a romantic nature, sort of a, a patina as speaks to our history, but also signal abandonment. Natural process happens where people do not intervene, um, where we can easily envision a world without us, maybe especially in a cemetery. Um, and here is Piranesi of the 18th century exploring the Roman ruins in much the same way with a fascination for and in, document, in documenting also the fallen culture of Rome. Byrne and Hillebecker um, are some of the early proponents, like their photographs from the 80s and 90s, who taught us to appreciate the sublime scale of our industrial heritage, a scale formerly reserved for civic and religious places. As did the Duisburg Nord project uh, that came out early in the, uh, in the, in the 1990s. Uh, this is a different project that we're going to look at up in Buffalo that's in the same green elevators uh, that Byrne and Hella Becker were documenting in Germany. Um, just to quote Kowarik from his Wild Urban Woodlands again, he contends that natural process, not an idealized picture of nature that has been retrospectively determined, is the central point of an urban wilderness. The areas where the process rather than the composition determine the valuation of wild urban landscapes. And the classic case of this is the Sugland Nature Park, where they're not sort of determining or doing restoration ecology, they're just sort of examining what has come in between these two, um, the separation between East and West Germany along this rail yard. These pictures are all probably familiar to you. It's a great to tell. It's meadow. Um, for New York City, Joel Sternfeld's romantic ph photographs of the High Line and, um, have secured the place of post-industrial wildlands in our contemporary urban culture. It's easy to forget that there is a great ambivalence about spontaneous flora on abandoned properties, which many perceive as dereliction, not as an exciting urban wilderness to explore. This ambivalence is best expressed in the High Line itself, where the ruderal ve vegetation was stripped away and replaced with a lush park designed by Pete Adoff in a wild naturalistic style. We're always looking for examples of how uh, the landscape can highlight or allow for succession and growth over time. And I remember being so excited that this was landscape architecture when I first learned about this example, where you're setting fire to a field and it felt like chaos. And I was like, this is also landscape architecture. It's not just planting tulips, it's not planting like a pretty garden. It's also like allowing the landscape to experience the power of its own dynamism. And here's Gilles Clement in his uh, uh, probably Andre de Citroën Park Perhaps it's not Gilles himself, but it, uh, with his book, uh, Le Jardin en Mouvement, he was allowing plants to sort of move through space um, as they will and sort of like self-organize. And even the, the uh, amazing example at the Met, which I, I couldn't believe that they let um, this artist make, where they, he just removed some of the tiles on the roof and planted a spontaneous urban uh, field that looks like pretty much every gutter in Red Hook. <laughs> But it was on the top of the um, on top of the mat, so it just completely changed the context of the thing that we were looking at. And I overheard many people say they they didn't know what this was all about. So yeah, exciting to have it in there, in a new context for new audience, not just like people who are pre-adapted to like plants and to think about lateral vegetation. Um, so what we always try to do in our office is sort of bring it back to our neighborhood, to Red Hook. Uh, finding beauty and poetry in unexpected places, not just in the beautiful gardens and parks of the city, and to allow natural process to, to enter our, our design process. And this is a picture I took a couple weeks ago. It's probably covered in snow or mush right now. But it's just so bucolic to think of this, um, this ball field that's sort of toxic and closed off because of the high lead content, turning into a meadow with the Red Hook housing in behind. It actually looks pastoral. It, look, it could be anywhere. Um, but today's lecture is um, mostly about adaptations in plants that we use in our design office. Um, adaptations are many that allow these plants to grow in tough, tough sites. Um, 
L strips are what we are um, sort of using as a model for plants that can grow on rooftops or that can grow on walls or that can grow on small, shallow soil profiles that can grow on structure. Because um, these are our projects. These are the kinds of places that we embrace. We don't see it as a negative thing. We see it as an opportunity to push out the limits of the plants we know and to experiment with um, ways of growing plants and bringing green to places that would ordinarily be considered a no-go for most designs. So the, the stresses in the urban environment are the, the heat of the pavement, the salt from road salt, but also in New York from the East River that blows in over storms. It's also foot traffic, it's also pollution, it's also exposure, it's wind, it's all these things. And there's certain adaptations that plants have to, to handle this. Salt tolerance is a tricky one, and I'm not sure I totally understand, but when we think about tolerant plants, we look at beach communities and draw from beach plants, um, plants that will be able to survive in our tough spots. Phragmites is a notorious um, rogue in the landscape. It's one of these plants that tolerates salt, and it's a specific salt, uh, salinity uh, tolerance that it have, that it's not quite salty enough for the plants that grow in salt marshes, but it's too salty for things like cattail. Um, and it's, it's mostly because of the environments that we've created that generate this specific ratio of salinity. Here it is under the, in the, the Van Wick over by uh, Fresh Meadows. Uh, plants can contend with salt tolerance or contend, contend with salt because of their uh, waxy foliage and their ability to spread rhizomatously and um, dig in deep to the soil. Some plants have root tolerance or soil tolerance to salt. They can tolerate like submersion in, um, in storms like Sandy. So this is one of the plants that is pretty much unscathed by the, the storm surge. Uh, other plants are, are the things that you'd likely suspect, like a hackberry or uh, sumacs, blueberry, mirica. All the, all the plants you think of as uh, beach plants are the plants that tolerate salt the most, clearly. And Bacchus, helimifolia, it has salt in its title. High pH is another one of the things that plants have to contend with. And this is just sort of a gloss over like some of the more scientific things. Uh, certainly not a scientist and designer looking to natural communities to sort of like bring tough plants to our garden spaces. But al alkaline soils are everywhere in our city and uh, the pH levels are pretty high. This can also bring rare plants into our cities like these ferns that um, are actually uh, uh, limestone loving plants is Polia atropurpurea, and it's a, a, a sort of a rare plant in western New Jersey where they form huge populations, but here it is in like sort of a drain pipe situation growing in the concrete mix with a mortar between the, the bricks out by fairway. So it's just one more thing that other plants have to contend with is the alkalinity, but some plants actually uh, thrive in it. In terms of wind and sun exposure, plants develop glauc on their on their foliage or they have succulents which means that they have a fleshy uh, sort of moisture content within their own leaves to keep them from drying out under <coughs> wind and sun exposure here's a cool plant that i found um, sort of growing in a wall in rome it's a umbilicus rupestris and it's sort of um, one of the sort of be most beautiful weeds i've ever found but it was everywhere um, and it, it's little succulent leaves helped it grow in these very tough exposed Roman walls. Here's some more tough guys from, from Rome, and you can tell a lot of plants are Mediterranean plants that can tolerate these um, exposures, like the herbs, like here up in the top of the wall is lavender. Anything with silver foliage is probably going to be drought and salt tolerant, or drought and exposure tolerant. Um, a lot of those plants also have essential oils that keep them from drying out, but they also have hairs that give the appearance of silveriness. And here's our, our native robascum. It's um, one, of the, one of the adaptations that our weeds have. Um, oftentimes this sloughs off as the plant matures. Uh, and here's a picture of a um, uh, Polonia tomentosa. It's, the, it's in the name itself, the tomentosa. Um, plants with needles are also tolerant of this exposure. And here's a pine grove that's newly planted forest out uh, by Casino Park. Uh, in our neighborhood, habitat disturbance is like the primary uh, force of uh, what's going to happen in Red Hook 
um, street pits and gutters and uh, abandoned lots because people like to mow things but only like to mow it like every once or twice a season. So it distributes the seeds pretty evenly and you can have two flushes of different weed patches every single year. Detura abounds and it's annual, um, it's, it's an annual so it spends a lot of its energy just making seeds and not roots and not a, a woody structure to hold on from year to year. Um, so its main function every season, like the annual borders I showed you early on from the ornamental borders, is to make uh, flowers and make seeds, as many as it can. It's not only true of weeds, it's true of asters as well. Anything in the composite family makes a million seeds and can, um, it, I feel like asters are one of the main uh, native plants that's like been propagating around Red Hook. And there's multiple uh, species. I'm not gonna key them out, but I have friends who key them out. And there's about 20 different species of aster that we found in, um, in Red Hook. Lepidiums, the Virginia, um, uh, Virgin, Virginia pepperweed, all seeds, shepherd's purse, seeds, plantain. There's entire strips on the street that are nothing but plantain. Um, and I, sort of the glamour puss of the seed dispersal world is the milkweed, um, which has just such ephemeral, beautiful seeds that um, everyone's happy to encounter it. Grasses make a ton of seed, they're usually annual, and this is a, actually one of the ones I've been seeing a lot more of in the city, along highways and stuff, uh, Hordium jubatum, which I've never seen, I hadn't really seen before, and I pay attention to these things. I don't know if anybody else has noticed this. Uh, Runex, Black Medic. Um, and here's a, um, a geranium, another way of seed dispersal is um, dehiscence, explosive dehiscence. These seeds actually are like catapulted away from the host plant so that they can make other populations. This is a native geranium, but the sort of like the poster child for this is the impatiens capensis, which when you touch the seeds, they explode in your hand. Um, and to show that to somebody who's never experienced it before is pretty exciting, but I am still excited by that every single time I do it. But maybe that's because I'm a 13-year-old um, boy at heart. Um, one of, the, one of the characters, or one of the adaptations that helps the most in thinking about plants on rooftops and in the tough places we, uh, we go to is thinking about compaction and flooding, um, plants that are gonna be able to tolerate tree pits when we do streetscapes, we have to think which plants are going to um, tolerate not only flooding, but also large periods of drought, especially in our biosoil plantings, uh, where it's not only inundated, it's also really dry and engineered soils. Here's like a little self-organizing um, nut sedge uh, slash papyrus looking um, novel ecosystem growing outside the Red Hook pool. But roots and modified stems are, are the main, uh, the main um, adaptation that we're looking for for our, for our plants. Because when something's rhizominous or has a deep uh, fibrous root system, it's gonna be more adaptive than other types of plants. This is an old, old picture from, drawn from a Brooklyn Botanic Garden handbook where it's all native plants, but you can see the roots all look different. Some are just like, you know, network systems. Some are more lateral. Some are more fleshy, and some are even forming like little bulblets or quorms. Fibrous root systems are typified by grasses, and this is a classic example of grasses um, where this diagram drawn by Heidi Natura, I think it's also uh, drawing on other diagrams before from uh, University of Illinois. But the root systems of these, of these Midwestern grasses and uh, even some of our Eastern species can penetrate 15 feet in the ground. Um, here's a little blue stem. Uh, oh, I don't have a little cursor. Little blue stems up in there. They're about six feet. Um, and Kentucky bluegrass is all the way to the left. And the penetration of the root zone is much more shallow. It's under a foot in this diagram, which is why it has to be irrigated so frequently. So when I was thinking about planting in shallow soils on structure and roofs, um, I thought, oh no, we can't have the grasses, like for sure they won't do well. But then of course we use the high line as a, a model and these plants don't only penetrate to 15 feet, they also can spread. Tap roots are another adaptation and uh, plants take root in very tough places. They can um, enter crevices between sidewalks and then penetrate and get the nutrients and moisture that they need. The farther down you go in the soil, the more consistent the temperature and more consistent the moisture is. And it helps such plants as like the Dolphus parata, which you see all over the place, Cananthus. Most tree um, seeds, when they first germinate, also form taproots that it, they do not persist. They don't all have taproots. 
But when uh, when a seed is germinating, it does have a taproot. And it, uh, if you've ever tried to pull out an oak or a hickory when it's first germinated, um, like a week in or a month in, it's nearly impossible because the, the root has already formed a taproot that goes down uh, one foot or more. They're really indestructible. Rhizome is the uh, adaptation of the plants that are the most vigorous in our urban environment. Here's the polygonum, uh, cuspidatum, or whatever it's called now. It's the Japanese knotweed that we're all familiar with. Um, and here's just erupting out of concrete, or erupting out of asphalt. It doesn't even need soil, or this is the kind of soil that it can tolerate. And that's the kind of heat that it loves. And there's something about that, that I, I, I can't hate these plants for um, being like terrible, pernicious weeds, because they have such a tenacity. Here's another great friend of the urban environment, the mugwort. And you can see it's a small plant, but it's already establishing a root system. It's already making a new plantlet. And what this will look like is uh, this, and not that long a period of time. Um, these rhizomes have the ability to network also and make new plants every time um, there's a scratch or I, you know, like whatever the stimulus is. If you broke this up, every single part of that plant would be able to uh, reproduce because it's undifferentiated stem tissue. That can either make roots or it can make plant, plants on top. It can make new stem tissue, it can make roots. Uh, it's remarkable in its ability to, um, to reproduce. And some, some plants have multivalent abilities to reproduce. And we showed the, um, the um, milkweed as a plant that makes a copious seeds. But this plant also has vegetative runners. It also makes rhizomes. So it has like this, two, this dual way of um, producing, uh, reproducing itself. And this is the kind of quality we're looking for in some of our plantings, where a plant is not only going to maybe seed in and sort of uh, relocate around a garden, but also has the ability to uh, tolerate um, shallow soils and uh, perform vigorously well. This is a little blueberry mat. Um, it's not only sort of herbaceous plants that suffer, it's woody plants as well. And most woody plants uh, that we're using in our projects, like the sumax and like blueberry, like what this is, is a blueberry mat and gay lusatia. Um, it forms a tight knit cluster of plant, uh, of roots that's almost impenetrable to other plants. So uh, weeds don't come into this. It's just really the plant you want. Parasitism is not something that we're really looking at to, um, to use in our plantings on roofs, but has been the most fascinating thing in this past year. Uh, I've found daughter everywhere. Um, it's just, you know, it's something that happens all over the city. But this is the first year I ever saw it actually taking root into a leaflet, and I saw its little suckers uh, just starting. It's the first few days of its inhabitation on this plant, or the occupation of this plant's system which will ultimately, in like a day or two, form this uh, cluster of roots. So as I mentioned, um, we have this program in our office. It's Spontaneous Urban Plants. It was a pre-existing um, program that we had in the office where we took walks and would take photographs of plants that we found around the city. Um, there was a website associated with this. And then um, there's an Instagram account that's still active. I don't think, that, I don't think the website is still active. And then we produced a book to just encourage people to get out there and look at the nature that's in the city, um, inspire others to explore the nature that, that can be found all around them in the city. My boss, David Sider, really likes this quote because it's sort of uh, from, from the Parks Commissioner, um, which is Silver, where it's just citing the street as one of the most, uh, the biggest opportunities for thinking about urban development in the next and in the next few years as we move forward. Um, parks represent 14% of the city's footprints. Streets and sidewalks is another 26%. So if we think of all of those places that we just looked at as opportunities to plant or to cultivate or to keep the plants that do really well in those places instead of eradicating them, we can have a really more vigorous green system throughout all of our uh, public realm. So in this way, we're revisioning what, what those weeds could be, how we can possibly use them in the future, how we can uh, think about weeds or like the strategies that weeds use in planting in these tough sites where very little else uh, does survive and without any maintenance. So this is our office. We're in Red Hook, and uh, these are the patches of different projects that we've uh, looked at. 
or uh, built, and we think of them as a collection of patches that together form a pretty big um, um, group of um, group of green space in the city. It's a network. It's not just like one big park. It's a bunch of little parks that add up to um, a sort of big acreage. And our approach integrates um, all of these sort of strategies that we saw that the weeds taking in the, in the field, and we develop them into design strategies. So we take the crack and we make it into a shelf, or we take uh, like the, the vining parthenocissus and we make armatures. So we're taking the plants and the, sort of the, the, um, the niches that they're finding on the street and we're making them into design typologies. So this sort of, uh, sort of epitomizes our, our, um, our design philosophy. We're large parks and preserved lands are traditional uh, components of the urban landscape. The often overlooked but more ubiquitous are the opportunities found in walls, roofs, lots, and streets. These smaller scale interventions, when stitched together, contribute to the ecological performance and livability of, this, of the city. I'm gonna zip through a few of our projects using these typologies. Um, we have wall and we have roof, and I have plenty of time, so I won't speed up anymore. Um, this particular project, Atlantic Plumbing, is in Washington, D.C., and it's where we focus on sort of like uh, our wall typology. So this is kind of, uh, you know, we feel at home in a place like this where it looks just like Red Hook or like any of the other sort of like industrial places around the city. Uh, they, when they uh, worked on this project, the initial site visits, they did some collections of plants they found, and then they looked at different um, sort of plants that were growing around this site as is. And we're sort of inspired by the patterns formed by the different vines and the armatures that were growing between the different um, parcels. And they actually did collect some of the seeds of plants that were there. This is a, a partnership with Morris Ajney, and uh, so this is a sort of a schematic design of that building, where it has an, an entire sort of exoskeleton of green uh, around the, uh, the building envelope. And here you can see um, there's green roof areas, which I think are quite shallow, and then th there are these little pans of plants that grow along the windows, which had to be the toughest of all tough plants. This is the project, I think it's in its third or fourth year, and it's pretty successful. Um, th they chose the right plants. Um, and it's just to envelop the building in sort of like a little haze of green, to bring a little bit of green to each of those um, building units. Um, it's not a big dramatic uh, element, but it's enough to soften uh, this building in like the uh, Piranesian uh, model of architecture that we saw, or like the, the model of a patina of green on buildings, to sort of soften their appearance in our, uh, in our cities. Some of the plants we chose were sort of iron, uh, you know, ironclad plants ready to, ready to take off. The Aragrossus spectabilis is one of the toughest of all of the tough native grasses, and it's a prolific seeder. It also fo uh, forms this beautiful haze in the, um, in the summer when it's in bloom. Little blue stem we found to be tolerant of just about any condition. It seems like it's such a sort of gentle, um, subtle, um, character in wild landscapes, but it actually takes to cultivation very well and tolerates all kinds of shallow soils. Saladego probably doesn't need any introduction, as, as most of these plants do. We're not looking for sort of like rare um, specialty plants. We're not looking for specimens. We're looking for field condition plants, plants that are gonna grow, expand, um, seed into places, and really survive and do well, uh, and form colonies of each other. Sometimes it's going to be a duel. It's going to be like a clash of the titans, like who's going to win, uh, who's not. Uh, but Solidago is one of those plants that's going to win it because it has the multivalent uh, forces it seeds in everywhere, but it also spreads rhizomatously. Vernonia lettermannii is a plant only introduced to me through the high line. I didn't know it before. Um, and it, but it seems like it's a, a very tough, tough plant, the, the narrow foliage allows it to live in places and tolerate the, some of the urban stresses we were talking about. And it's a much tidier plant than other, other uh, species like Amsonia that, um, that you would grow for that same sort of similar texture, except it's a finer texture. It's sort of more compact and nicer overall and it fits into smaller planters better. Euphorbia mercenides is an old timey garden plant and is a little bit of a pest, but 
um, because it does its seeds in and it's explosively dehiscent also. You can hear its little seeds pop and it will, it will take over an entire area. But it's one of those plants you can tell it's going to succeed because of its glaucous foliage and it's sort of slightly succulent nature. Um, and it's a good low cascader for areas where we're doing uh, containers or these window box treatments. Uh, again, Parthenocystis is just going to live wherever you put it because it's one of the toughest plants on the, on the planet. It's a little bit like poison ivy in that way and, you know, not surprisingly related. Um, it has beautiful foliage and then it also turns a scarlet red. So it's one of the plants we often couple with uh, an evergreen plant to provide coverage on walls, especially walls if, you know, sometimes we want to reveal them, sometimes we want to hide them. Minister Pileata, classic garden plant, but also super tolerant of shallow soils. It's going to be an evergreen structure for, uh, for any planting. Our roof typology. This is sort of a, a classic green, uh, green roof that Future Green did in the meatpacking district, um, which if you remember has these awnings in the olden days that used to step over the streets. And here uh, um, our architect um, collaborator uh, recreated that awning and we planted it up with things that are gonna survive. We did, um, you know, Parthenocystis vines that are gonna hang down, um, Rustifina and Juniper, sort of a, cl a classic grouping, classic beach grouping as well. And things that are gonna thrive and climb up, like Campsus, uh, something that's just going to be a true survivor and also offer a lot of um, vegetation to, to protect or to, um, to mask unsightly um, and slightly things on a building. Rustifina, it's not my favorite roost, but it's one that will grow tall and be like a small tree and tolerate almost any condition you throw it in. The Juniper's Conferred is like my favorite juniper because it has a nicer quality than other, some of the other species. It has um, sort of a blue quality and then it also has a nice way of making like, almost like balls as it moves along. Cesslaria, some of these plants I don't even need to introduce you. We're all using the same plants in all of our gardens uh, throughout the city. It's becoming a, a little bit of a problem where all our spaces all sort of look very, very similar. And um, it's the context that changes them. It's our actual design that changes them. Um, but every single plant you can ever imagine is available to us, like the more gardeny ones, but then the more, the more meadowy ones as well. So it's just a, sort of an open question as to why most of our garden spaces are starting to look the same. We use Liatris aspera, taking clues from the Midwestern prairies. Again, it's gonna be a tough plant. And just goes in with grasses very well because there's a lot of movement. Because the flowers are at the end, it extends the movement because it's almost like a pendulum effect. Kansas radicans. Vigorous, vigorous plants. Nothing so like special about any of them. But together they form like really strong plant communities. This is my favorite project in our office. It's the um, Brooklyn Children's Museum. And it was a heavily programmed space where the client, the Brooklyn Children's Museum, had, um, they wanted to have a native plant garden, which, you know, that's great. They also wanted to have like a little garden with a fake lawn, okay. And then a lounge area where people just needed to have a little bit of shade on the, on the roof. Um, and this is what we created. This is our little native garden that we created on the roof. I think we, um, and they, overestimated the amount of shade in this garden. So we had the whole backside of this fern we thought would be enough shade for like some of our special ferns, but it turned out it was quite, quite sunny. Um, but this is how it looks from above. The screen in the center is designed by Toshika Mori. Um, and actually the entire terrace in the summer heats up to about 120 degrees when we were planting. It was. Uh, unbearably hot. It was, it was unbelievably hot and exposed. So hopefully these trees will all survive and hopefully the shade will protect the children who are out there and our new trees will also protect them further. We chose to use catalpas, which are going to be quick growing. They were on adjacent lots and they had beautiful flowers. Um, so sort of like bringing something in from the neighborhood up on top and then providing nice shade trees. We also use sassafras and magnolia. There's our catalpa, a tough urban tree. Sassafras will grow anywhere. Um, I've seen it suckering out. Um, it grows from root suckers. Catinus obovatus is related to the sumacs, so it's not surprising again that it um, is able to survive really tough conditions. Um, it's tolerant of drought, 
and it looks fantastic. It, it was just, uh, it just turned foliage color um, last week before the snow, and it was, uh, the snow was actually carrying, um, or the, the leaves were still carrying uh, snow. Eupatorium hesopifolium has really great foliage. It's very narrow. It's going to be one of the ones that tolerates all of the, the wind stress and exposure. You can tell just looking at the morphology of that plant that it's probably going to succeed. And then it's also a composite, so it's going to spread. And it also is going to spread vegetatively through its roots. This is a carex that my friend Heather Lindgren recommended to me. I didn't know it before. Uh, we had been using carex Ibernia. And this carex actually spreads rhizomatously as opposed to Ibernia, which makes like little tuffets. Budaloa just blooms early in the season, super tough. Um, but it blooms at a time when other grasses are still sort of just tuffets in the, in the landscape. Um, Agasachi purple haze is so much better than uh, salvia because it has a longer bloom time and doesn't require the sort of management practices that salvia requires. And Astra blongifolia, so it's basically the same thing, but it's a tidy aster. It forms a mound, and it's a, a little bit more formal language than many of the asters, which can get kind of rangy. Pygmianthemum is just an amazing plant, and it's also rhizomatous, makes huge colonies of itself. This is our last project that we'll talk about, and um, I'll zoom through it because uh, you know it's many of the plants we have already spoken about. But it was a rare client that actually wanted us to explore sort of the wild nature of the site, uh, the existing conditions, which are um, you know at, th at this point in the lecture you know are kind of right in our wheelhouse. We're sort of like this tough, tough urban um, spot right by a railroad, and um, you know with a lot of existing weeds on site. Here's um, Polygonum cuspidatum along the edge. Uh, there's Alanthus trees and stuff along the, the railroad tracks, and then there's other various weeds and rubble to contend with. And it turned into like a party spot where they have uh, very successful gatherings for the neighborhood people and also hipsters and um, people to play ping pong. We developed a whole social um, uh, program for them as well. But mostly we use weedy plants, and it's a very successful project. It's sort of like a nightclub that people go to, and very great neighborhood project. It's just between uh, where a neighborhood is all hanging together. It's not too developed, but it's like nice enough where people are coexisting in a really good way. It feels good to be there. Um, some of the plants that we uh, planted were drawing on plants that we found on the site, like this eastern cottonwood. It's sort of typical weed plants, uh, even Betula populifolia. Like birches have a terrible time in the city, but it's a short-lived project. They have a, a lease on this project for a short term, so it's one of the plants that is going to be quick growing and successful for a short term, and you know, we weren't really considering the borer application. Euthamia caroliniana, some of the things we, we both seeded, we planted clubs, and we planted uh, gallon plants in this site. Plants that are just n never going to die in Solidago sempervirens. Here we were playing with some straight up weed plants like chicory and pybus. Other plants, we'll zoom through. It's, you can always know something else. I am not going to talk about them. <laughs> Al's looking at me like he's going to like drag me off the stage in a second. Um, and I, I wouldn't blame him. But um, some of the things, like, I am going to talk about them. So it seeds like uh, uh, Chemicrista is one of the centers that's been growing around. It's an annual. And it can just seed in. And it's really inconspicuous when it blooms in the fall. And it's very hardy. And it makes great seeds. And it's just a nice texture. And it's a low plant. It's like it would take no space, it would, but it would create a nice layer of vegetation in the garden. Baptisia is the same thing. It, f it flowers early. It's kind of cool. It seeds in, and then it disappears. It's like a, almost like a tumbleweed in your garden. I always like to plant bulbs. Bulbs are super successful in our sites because they, um, you know, they all deal with drought so well. And here is like you know, a special species tulip that I grew in the, the botanic garden, tulip uh, acuminata. But all of the bulbs do super well in our, our uh, sites, as does this Gladiolus byzantinus. Kind of a traditional garden plant, but I think it looks really great with uh, the grasses that we're growing. Sanguisorbas are coming back. They're having a whole revitalization. I'm not sure that these are going to do great on rooftops, but I think they're amazing. They have great vegetation. And like the liatris, the, the seed heads are at the end. The flowers are at the end, so they have a lot of movement. And other species of Asclepias. This is Speciosa. And other cool vining species like this Clematis adesoniae from Mount Cubicenta. This is another project they do where it's just um, sort of talking about landscapes. Um, so that's coming in the future. 
uh, I'll, I'll tell you about this in a second. Uh, I just wanted to end with a quote from my friend Marie Warsh, who's a historian at the um, Central Park Conservancy. And she was telling me that Frederick Law Olmsted found inspiration for the ramble in Central Park from the jungles of Panama, where he witnessed the superabundant creative power, infinite resource, and liberality of nature that the jungles of Panama had to uh, offer him. And I find the same sort of like infinite resource, superabundant creative power in the weeds and in like the natural history of our own city. Thank you. And just as an aside, this is a project I do with my friend Marie Worsch, and it combines artists, poets, landscape people, um, and we create a theme a year, and we produce a, um, a self-published journal. Next year, it's going to be Wastelands, and I'd invite all of you to sort of contribute projects. Uh, there'll be updates on my website, lenprince.org, just as a, a shameless plug at the end of this lecture. Thank you. Maybe there's time for questions. Oh, What's up? Oh, there's one more. Do we have time for any questions, or are there any questions? Yes. It's past time. Ask me questions at break. Okay. Just start rolling now. So what are we doing? Okay. 